How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the channel. This is Each One Reach One. I pray and I hope that I can teach and reach one of you with this lesson, Lord willing. Thanks for joining me today. Let us give all praise, honor, and glory to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, in the name of our King, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shad. All right, so you see the title. I don't know what the title is going to be yet, but by the time you're seeing it, I've come up with one. But I knew, do know the subject matter. We are discussing God's love and God's character. Does God love? We know that he does. Does God hate? That is what seems to be a question that many can't answer. Everyone can say, yes, God loves. But many people can't answer the question of, does God hate? The inspiration for this video, like always, is the Holy Spirit. I've been, you know, sent, or I should say certain things were sent to come across my path to inspire me to do this. And so, you know, and one way it happens is through vexation of spirit, right? And so some things that kind of vex my spirit is this teaching that I've heard, I've long heard, we've all heard it, but because I've been hearing it a lot lately and in response to, you know, people coming against us, the Israelites awakening and, you know, proclaiming God's truth, they say, you know, we can't be of God. We can't be his children because, we're pushing this message that says God hates people and that God doesn't love everybody because Christianity has told them that God loves everybody. God doesn't hate anybody. And then, and since we're coming and pushing a different message, they believe we're preaching a different Christ. We're preaching a different gospel that we're reading from a completely different book that we are uh, talking about Satan. But we are talking about this book. We are talking about the God of the Bible. So let's go and let's get John 316. We're going to break that down and we're going to go and get some scriptures from the Old Testament. And we're going to try to get to understand the nature and the character of our God that we serve. You say that you love him. Well, then you got to get to know him. You can't love him and you don't know him. You can't have a relationship with him and you don't know him. You can't claim to want a relationship with him and you don't try to get to know him. All right. Don't try to get to know him through any doctrines of religion. You got to go into the book. Anybody who's trying to keep you out of the Old Testament, they're trying to keep you away from God. They're trying to keep you out of a relationship with him and they're trying to keep you from getting to know him. They have an agenda. All right, so we're going to begin with the ever famous John 3.16. Just to, to springboard off of that, because again, it's the inspiration for the video. So we're going to start with it. Every Christian knows this verse. Every Christian goes to this verse immediately in any discussion or debate about God and, and, and who can be a child of God and who are saved, quote unquote, who can receive salvation and so forth. These conversations will always invoke the bringing up of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right, so... They, you know, these, this is hitting on the ever famous whosoever believeth in him um, fallacy of Christianity and the God, God so loved the world. And when they hear this, they believe that when he says world, he is talking about the earth because people try to use modern speak to interpret and to understand ancient texts, ancient writings which is a mistake, all right? Even the context, though, of this chapter disputes the belief of Christians. But we're going to go into history. Let's go into Genesis. And so this is definitely going to be too long to be a one-parter, so we'll be breaking this one up, all right? John, I'm sorry, not John, Genesis chapter 6 is where we're going. We're going to start at verse one. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord Yahweh said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. Now it's believed that when it says the sons of God here, that is talking about angels. That's what many people believe this is a reference to. And there are others who believe that this is a reference to the line of Shem. All right, that this is the Shemitic line. I'm sorry, I, I said Shem. I didn't mean Shem. I meant Seth. <laughs> this is the line of Seth. All right, this is Seth's lineage. All right. And so which one is true? Well, it has to be the latter because God created the angels as spirits and they can't procreate. All right. They can't procreate. This is a fallacy. Right. That's why when Christ spoke, when he said that um, that the Pharisees, they erred not understanding the scriptures, that in the resurrection, you know, they, they would not be given in, in marriage for they would be as the angels it's because the angels don't procreate. So marriage is procreation. He was saying that they wouldn't procreate in the resurrection. All right. Neither marrying nor giving in marriage. Okay. So let's, let's continue. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the, the Lord Yahweh that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And Yahweh said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. Make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in it and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. So God so loved the world that he's about to destroy it. He's about to destroy all these people. All right, there's a belief that God wouldn't kill, he wouldn't destroy people because he loves everybody. He, so he loves everybody so much that he's about to destroy everybody except for Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. But with thee, I will establish my covenant. You see, he says, I'm going to establish my covenant with Noah, not with the entire earth, not with all the people of the earth, but with Noah. I'm going to kill everybody else. And I'm going to make you um, the family in whom I'm going to repopulate the earth with. I'm going to make a covenant with you, not with the whole entire earth, not with all the world. So he's singling out Noah to be special, right? 
but with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every, okay, that's about, well, I got the point that I wanted to get from here. All right. So as you see, he didn't choose everyone in the earth. He didn't love everybody so much that, that he decided to make a covenant with the whole world. There's wicked people in the earth and wicked people are at odds with God and he will destroy you out of the earth because you are wicked. All right. So you see an example of God destroying the inhabitants of the earth and, and saving a small group of people. All right. Let's go to chapter seven. So let's get verse 15. And they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. All right. So this is the entering into the ark of the animals. Okay. It's coming down to verse 23. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And, on, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were in the ark, and they that were with him in the ark. So as you see, Noah was saved, and those that were with him in the ark. Everyone else outside of the ark, they were killed. All right? They were destroyed. Everyone and everything, it all met the wrath of God. This is another example or a further illustration, a continuing illustration of his wrath upon the earth and how he will destroy people and how he doesn't love everybody. God is not above or adverse to destroying everybody. But he did say he wouldn't do it again with water. But he never said that he wouldn't destroy anybody again. All right, so... If he loved everybody, he would never destroy anybody, but he destroys. Genesis 9 and 22. We're just trying to show pattern of behavior because if you want to get to know somebody, watch what they do. You can listen to what they say, but more importantly, watch what they do. In the case of God, it's very important to take heed to what he says. Because he doesn't lie. Men, they lie. So you got to watch their actions more than their words. But with God, his words are everything. His words proceed his actions. All right? And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness. Well, let's, let's, yeah, you will start. I'm not going to go up further. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. All right. So Ham pointed out his father's nakedness, told his brothers and his brothers, Shep, uh, Shem and Japheth, they came, walked backwards, bringing a garment and they laid it upon their shoulders and they covered their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem. Blessed be Yahweh, God of Shem. All right. He didn't say, my God. He didn't say the God of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He didn't say the God of Japheth and Shem, the God of Shem. So even among Noah's three sons, there was a special line that God loved more. There was a brother that God chose of all the three sons of Noah. He didn't choose them all. He chose the line of Shem to be the line, the righteous line to re-inhabit the earth, all right? That all of the three brothers were going to be responsible for bringing the souls that were before the flood back into the earth. 
So again, you see, there's favoritism here. This is not a case of God's loving everybody equally. God doesn't feel the same way about everybody. He doesn't put everybody on equal footing. God shows favoritism. Okay, this is important to establish because there's this erroneous belief out there that God does not show favoritism. He doesn't choose favorites, but he does. Just watch what he has done. Okay, so let's continue. We're going to get Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the Lord Yahweh has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So Abram, Father Abram, is being told to leave his country, leave his kindred and his father's house. Most High God is already separating Abram from his family, from his countrymen, from his people. So among his people, Abram was, was shown favoritism. He was selected out of all of the people that were in the earth to be the chosen bloodline. The bloodline that God will show favoritism to. This is not an illustration of God loving the entire world. This is an illustration of God picking and choosing. All right, let's get verse seven. And Yahweh appeared unto Abram and said, unto thy seed will I give this land, not unto the entire world, not unto all the nations of the world. He told Abram specifically, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto Yahweh who appeared unto him. All right, so you see, Abram, who was renamed Abraham, was seen as special by God, was chosen by God to have a relationship with him. He even calls him his friend, all right? He doesn't bestow that honor on anyone else. Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of Yahweh came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I am your shield, not the shield of all the people of the earth. I am your shield. He told Abram, fear not. He didn't tell everybody not to fear. He didn't, he didn't want everybody to be comforted. There's other people who he wanted to be fearful. But he told Abram, fear not. He told Abram, I am your shield. Again, not the whole earth. And thy exceeding great reward. I am your exceeding great reward, Abram. Not the great reward of all the people of the earth. Are we getting this so far? Okay. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. He's establishing that it's all about a bloodline, that this person who is in Abram's house, that is Abram's servant, Abram doesn't have any son, any sons. This is the closest thing that he has to a child. It's Eliezer. All right. But Eliezer is not going to get the blessing of inheritance. He's not going to be Abram's heir. Abram's heir would come from his own bowels. So there, there goes the spiritual Israelite argument. You can't just be who, anybody who, who converts to Christianity, whosoever believes in Christ. No, you have to be of Abram's bloodline. You have to be one of his descendants. This is the promise of God. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So it's all about Abram's seed, all about his bloodline. The Most High God is choosing. He chose Abram and he says, I'm going to choose your bloodline. I'm going to bless your bloodline. Your seed shall be numerous. Your seed shall be blessed. Not 
all the people of the world. Again, we are establishing pattern of behavior, pattern of action, a pattern of thought. All right, Genesis chapter 16, verse one. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, behold now, Yahweh hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. After Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. All right. So as you can see, this is the establishing of the two wives, the two first wives of Abram. And that there's a difference between the two. There is a difference between the two. We're just establishing the foundation so far. All right. They aren't equal in the eyes of God. They aren't equally loved, beloved of God. All right. So let's go down to verse 15. And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. All right, so Ishmael is Abram's firstborn son. Okay, let's go to chapter 17. We're still building. We are going to get verse 1. Well, we're going to start at verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord Yahweh appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, between me and you. I will make my covenant between me and you, Abram, not with all the earth. God loves Abraham, and he's showing him he's not making a covenant with the entire earth. He says, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, many Christians believe that when he's called a father of many nations, that is a reference to all the Christian believers that because they believe in Christ, who comes from the bloodline of Abraham, that because they believe in him, that they become spiritual Israelites and thereby they get adopted into Abraham's bloodline. And they, and they become the, the many nations. Not so, but we're not going to just take my word for it. We're going to get it out of the book. All right. It says, neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So again, we are hammering home the fact that God made a covenant with Abraham, that Abraham was chosen out of all the people in the earth to be God's favorite, to be his, his, his covenant bearer, to be the person who he institutes his covenant with, I should say. Why didn't he call all the people of the earth together to make a covenant with all of them? He could have if he wanted to, but he didn't want to, so he didn't do that. You're supposed to know what he, what he wants by what he does, all right? He's showing you so that you wouldn't have to guess. Christianity shouldn't be able to fool you if you just listen to the word of God and use common sense, all right? If he loved everybody, he would have made a, an agreement with everybody, but he didn't. 
He has not shown yet through anything that we've read that he loves all the people of the entire earth. You can't, you can't find anything to support that. All right. Nothing that he's done and nothing that he has said. Let's come down to verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. You notice Hagar didn't receive this blessing. He didn't show favor to, to Hagar. He didn't say, I will bless Hagar. He's not yet. That's going to happen. But even though she had his son first, Sarah is getting the blessing first of the two women. Sarah is getting the blessing and Sarah is being given the biggest and the best blessing. I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him. Not with his firstborn son, Ishmael. I will establish my covenant with your son, Isaac, for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. All right. So the promise, you, you see in the line in which the promise is traveling from Abraham bypassed his son, Ishmael, is going to his son, Isaac. All right. So God is not saying, hey, I love I love everybody the same. Why is he not loving and showing favoritism and, and blessing Ishmael with the covenant like he's doing Isaac because he doesn't love everybody because God has favorites. He makes a distinction between people. All right. He says, and as for Ishmael, see, so Ishmael's not being completely left out. I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. All right. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. You see this? So as you see, God is keeping his promise. Right. To, to, that he made to Abraham. His seed shall be as the sand of the sea. Ishmael is also his son. He's not the chosen son, but it's still his seed. And his seed still counts as Abraham's seed. So in totality, Abraham's seed is, is being set up to become as numerous as the sand of the sea. But the bloodline of Ishmael is not the chosen seed. There is a difference. Okay? He says, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. All right. So again, there is a favoritism being shown between Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac is going to get the major blessing. Ishmael got a blessing too, but his blessing is not on par with the blessings of Isaac. Now, when it pertains to the kingdom, the Most High God has chosen Israel to be his peculiar people. And they will be set apart from the other nations and receive an extra special blessing in the kingdom as the children of God. But there will be other people in the kingdom that will be blessed, but they will not be blessed on par with the Israelites. Now, Israelites, don't lose your minds. I'm talking about the kingdom. We're not yet talking, we're not talking about the thousand year reign of Yahweh Shah. That is not the time when the heathen, when the Gentiles receive blessings, all right? The Gentiles are going to have the thousand-year reign of Yahweh Shai in order to earn their way into the kingdom through their works. And those who earn their way into the kingdom with their works, they're going to make it into the kingdom, but they are not going to be the children of God. They will be the subjects 
of God and the Israelites in the kingdom. All right. Just picture in your mind a royal family. That's the Israelites with their king, Christ, and the father, our king, above us in the kingdom. And beneath us, the Israelites will be our people, the subjects of our kingdom, the people over whom we rule in the kingdom. So they will be blessed to, give, to be given eternal life and make it into the kingdom, but they will not be blessed on par with the Israelites. I just had to give that to somebody. All right, somebody definitely need it. All right, so let's go to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, verse 9. So as you see, this is during the time when Isaac is born. All right, so verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abram, Abraham, mocking. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. So um, Ishmael was mocking Isaac. If you haven't read yet, you should read the book of Jasher. It's a really good book to read. It kind of fills, not kind of, it fills in a lot of the, the gaps in the stories that we, that we read. And it gives you some more of the detail. All right. Where the Bible is kind of broad stroking and not really coloring in and, and, and showing you all the detail of the story. Jasher helps fill in the detail. So Ishmael was mocking Isaac. And Isaac's mother, Sarah, she didn't like it. And this is a, a microcosm of what happens now, right? The blessed line are being mocked by the people of the flesh, the children of the flesh. But they're not the blessed line. They have no idea that they aren't even the blessed line. Why? How, how are you mocking? How dare you mock, mock the chosen of God, the blessed seed? Right. And God doesn't like you mocking the blessed seed. And so he will separate you from the blessed seed for your mocking. You only get into the kingdom through Israel. You have to cleave unto Israel. Israel gets into the kingdom through Christ. The other nations you get into the kingdom through Israel. You have to cling to the people who are clinging to Christ. That's how you make it hierarchy. God has set the Israelites above you to be your kings, your priests, your rulers. You have to bow and bend the knee before the Israelites to get in. That's the way of God. The Israelites have to bend the knee to Christ to get in. But when you, as the Gentiles, you, when you bend the knee to his people, you're also bending the knee to him. But he is going to get his people Fame and praise in the earth is what he says. So it is not unrighteous to say that you're going to have to bend the knee to Israel because he's the one who says he's going to make the people do it. He says, I'm going to make them come and bow at your feet. He wants his people to receive praise. He's not going to allow you to go around them, to usurp them or to mock them. And because of your mocking and your attempt at usurping them, he's going to make you come and bow at their feet. He's not going to let you come to him directly. Continuing on. <laughs> um, Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son, Ishmael. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God is making a point to let to let him, Abraham know that, a, that he is pleased with what Sarah has done with casting off Ishmael and his mother because it's by the will of God. Man's goings are not their own. It was at God's um, instruction and God doing the moving. That's why she did it. All right. So God was pleased with this action because it was his desire for Ishmael and his mother to be separated from Sarah, Abraham, and Isaac, showing favoritism. All right. 
that even though Abraham was his friend, even though he loved Abraham, even though he chose Abraham to be the man of his covenant, the father of many nations, he didn't love Ishmael. You see? All right, so continuing on. And God said, oh, no, that's, what, that's not what we're going. Uh, verse 13. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. So Isaac is the chosen line, but the son of the bondwoman, who is Ishmael, he says, I will make a nation because he is thy seed. He was telling Abraham, don't fret over your, over your son Ishmael being cast out. He's your son. So I'm going to bless him, but he's not going to be blessed on par with Isaac. But because he is your son, I'm going to bless him. That's how much he loves Abraham. That even though he didn't love Ishmael, he still gave Ishmael a blessing because of his love for Abraham. He did not have the same love for all the people of the earth. This is a special love and a relationship that he has with Abraham. Let's go to Genesis chapter 25. Verse 19 is where we want to start. Isaac's sons is the subject matter. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, and uh, Bethuel the Syrian of Panda. Padanaram, Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. Let's get that again. Let's clean that up. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord Yahweh was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggle together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto her, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And, one, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. So Isaac his wife is pregnant with twins. These twins will represent two separate nations. Yes, they are brothers. Yes, they are twins, but they represent different nations, as did the sons of Isaac, all 12 of Isaac. I'm sorry, the, the sons of Ishmael, all 12 sons of Ishmael represented different nations. Okay. And when you read in the in the Old Testament, you see how the, the 12 sons of Jacob are referred to as different nations. Each blood, each son's bloodline is referred to as a nation. This, these are the many nations. That God spoke of when he said, when he told Abraham, I will make thee a father of many nations. It wasn't talking about the Christian converts. It wasn't talking about whosoever of all the nations of the world that believe in Jesus. You get to become one of these people, one of the many nations that are, that become a spiritual Israelite, that become of the bloodline of Abraham all of a sudden. That's madness and confusion. It's not the word of God. All right. So these two brothers will become two different nations. One people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. So even of Isaac, Isaac received the promise, right? And even, but even of Isaac, the same as his father, both of his sons are not being chosen. Both of his sons are not seen as equal or on par with one another in the eyes of God. Of his two sons, the most high God has chose chosen a favorite okay verse 24 and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled behold there were twins in her womb and the first came out red 
all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare him. Why did they give a description of Esau, but not a description of Jacob? Well, it was because there was nothing odd about Jacob when he was born. Esau, he was odd in his appearance. Jacob looked like his father. Jacob looked like, looked like his people. There was nothing different about him to note, but there was something different about Esau. And the, the different one, the one that was different from everybody else, he was not the chosen line. The chosen line was the one who looked like his father. The chosen line came through the one who looked like the rest of his people. All right? So there is a difference being made between Jacob and Esau, two twin brothers. But between the two, God chose a favorite. He doesn't love them equally. They are not even in the eyes of God. All right. So let's go to Malachi chapter one. Let's get verse one. First, let's get the subject. God's love for Jacob. The burden of the word of Yahweh to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you Speaking to Israel, saith Yahweh. See, he confesses his love for Israel, to Israel. Where can you go in the book anywhere where you can find God confessing and professing his love to any other people? He's establishing by his own mouth, his own word, who he loves. If he loves everybody, why is he making Israel a special people? Why is he professing his love to them? I have loved you, saith Yahweh, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? And he's the God's response. Was not Esau Jacob's brother? He's making a point. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord Yahweh? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. So God loves and he hates of two brothers from the same mother and father. God has chosen one and set his love there, but not upon the other. He says about Esau, I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. It says, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord, Yahweh of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people whom the Lord hath indignation forever. He says that he will have indignation against these people forever righteous hatred. He said he would have righteous hatred against these people forever. But people say that God doesn't hate, that he loves everybody, but that's not what he says. All right? Let's get Romans chapter 9. Verse 13, as it is written, written where? In the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter one, like we just read, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, right? Is God unrighteous because he loves some people and hates others, that he has a a favorite, that he plays favorites, that he has a chosen people, God forbid, it is not unrighteous. Right? That's what he's establishing, that he doesn't love everybody. Paul is even telling you this. Paul understood this. So I don't understand how Christians make an entire doctrine around what, what Paul said 
and they believe that replacement theology is what Paul was teaching. He never taught that. So we're getting to know God through God, through his word, not through the precepts of men. Let's get Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if ye, he's talking to Israel, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye, Israel, shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. So he's saying, I created all the people. Everything in it is mine. But Israel, remember, remember he said, Israel, I love you. Israel, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. You will be above all people. This is the statement God is making to Israel. Not the entire earth, right? Let's get Psalm 135, verse 4. For the Lord Yahweh hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Again, not the entire earth, not the whole world, but Jacob, Israel, has he chosen unto himself to be his peculiar treasure. He told Israel, I love you. Never makes a statement. I love the whole entire earth. I love all the people of the world. He never says that. People say that. God never says it. Deuteronomy chapter four. Let's start at verse one. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, so you know who's talking and you know who he's talking to. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish anything from it that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your God, which I command you. So you can't take anything away from the word and you can't add anything, anything to it. God said he loves Israel. If you're saying that he loves everybody of the earth, you're adding to it. And by adding, you're diminishing from it because you're taking away from his special relationship with Israel by saying that he loves everybody. But God has been making a, an entire point through the whole Bible to show his love for this particular people. And then you come along and say, no, 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 no. They, they're not special. He loves everybody. But he's trying to tell these people, I love you. He's trying to confess his love to them. And then you come along and say, no, 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 no. Just imagine a man on bending knee trying to woo his woman and convince her and, and explain to her how much he loves her. I love you so much. And he's going through this whole thing and every kind of way he can explain it and show her, he's trying to show he loves. And then some stranger walks by while he's professing his love to his woman and says, no, no, no. He doesn't love you. He loves everybody. He loves all women. You're not special. He loves all women. And then she turns and says, really? How do you know? He, he said that? Mm, no, but but he does though. That's what's going on right now with Christianity. Christianity is like, eh, he does. He doesn't say it anywhere in the book, but he does though. And it doesn't say it anywhere in the book. But I know what you, I hear you. John 3 16. See, your Christian leaders, they know the truth. But you average Christians, you don't know. That's what I mean. They know, but you don't know, but it's time for you to know. It's time for you to come out of the dark. All right? He says, your eyes have seen what Yahweh did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God, have destroyed them from among you. 
but ye that did cleave unto Yahweh, your God, are alive, every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Yahweh my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. So God has made this covenant with Israel and he's given them statutes, commandments, and judgments for them to keep, given these things to live by and these things to do so that when the other nations would look upon them, they would see them as wise and know that God was with them, that, the, that it would be obvious that God is with them, loves them, has favored them and chosen them when people look upon them. The problem is that because we greatly sinned against our God, he withdrew himself from us, allowed us to go in, allowed us to go into slavery. And so our wisdom and understanding, which we were supposed to have in the sight of the nations, was taken from us. Therefore, no one believes or, or no one believed for a long time or knew for a long time that we were the children of God, that we were the Israelites. Because look at those people. They can't be the Israelites because they didn't understand the judgments of God that his, his punishment came down on his people, his beloved chosen people, because of their disobedience. Our disobedience. I'm not going to disconnect myself from my people. Right? He says, surely, wait, let's, let's go back up. He says, keep therefore and do them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes. All the other nations, they're going to hear all these statutes and they're going to say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. See, everybody is supposed to get to know God through us, through the people who he loves and chose. For what nation is there so great or who hath God so nigh unto them as Yahweh our God is in all things that we call upon him for. So the most high God has not been near to any other nation the way, he's, the way he was with Israel, the way he is with Israel. All right. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? None. That's the answer to the question. None, because Yahweh did not deal with any other nation the way he dealt with Israel. Don't take my word for it. We'll get it out of the scripture. Amos chapter three, verse one. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family, which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Again, listen to the statement. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. So if he loves everybody, why doesn't he know everybody? He says, I only know you, Israel. He says, I love you. Israel, he says, I know all the people, all the families of the earth, all the nations. He says, only you have I known. Only you have I known. That's a close relationship. Meaning he didn't have this close loving relationship or this, this affection towards all the people. It was reserved for Israel. Psalm. 147, verse 19. Concerning the Most High God, he showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel, no, unto the whole world, unto Israel, unto whosoever believes, unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord Yahweh. This is the truth of the matter. God has not dealt this way with any other nation besides Israel. He has no relationship 
with any other people besides Israel. Yes, he created all the other people, but he has not had a relationship with any of the other people, right? This, this is the truth of God, the truth of the scripture, which they try to keep hidden from you in the church, all right? But for the sake of time, we'll cut this one here and we'll be back for part two where we'll wrap this up, all right? So thank you guys for joining me today. Before we leave, give all praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God, Jehovah, in the name of the Beloved Son, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, our King. We give thanks for the Holy Spirit and for the fruit thereof. I pray that you guys all were blessed today, that you benefited from this lesson. Don't hoard it. Pay it forward. Each one, reach one. Shalom.